All right, good afternoon, friends. I see a few people are still logging in, but I'm going to go ahead and get this intro section started. Um, and then we'll let the amazing autumn take over after that. Uh, so welcome this afternoon to Bullying 102, a deeper dive into bullying by Mission West Virginia's very own Autumn Wagner. So we're going to go over quickly um, over who Mission West Virginia is in our programs, and then we'll go to our presentation, um, and then we'll end with a question answer session. So Mission West Virginia is leading a statewide effort to promote positive futures for all kids in West Virginia. We work alongside families as they navigate West Virginia's foster care system and provide evidence-based life skills education to help teens envision and create positive futures. As a result of our work putting kids first in collaboration with social services, school districts, private foster care agencies, and other nonprofits, the future looks brighter for West Virginia. <clears throat> We do this through two primary programs at Mission. The first being Frameworks, and Frameworks provides support for those interested in foster care or kinship care to understand the system, find a placement agency, and prepare to make a meaningful difference in the life of a child. If you're interested in learning more about how to become a foster and or an adoptive parent in West Virginia, please call and speak to Sunny at 866-CALL-MWV or 304-512-0555. You can also request an information packet from our website at www.missionwv.org backslash request hyphen information. The second program we have um, is the THINK program, which stands for Teaching Health Instead of Nagging Kids. Um, THINK empowers teens to make positive life choices through education, life skills, and coaching. Our program is evidence-based and helps the students we work with navigate the social-emotional pressures all teens face as they develop. This includes building healthy relationships and healthy choices around drugs and alcohol and pregnancy prevention. So we deliver our program in partnership with schools in 20 counties. We are vetted by district leaders, teachers, and other school leaders who are trained to work with kids. The program's evidence-based curriculum has been shown to have a positive effect on preventing teen pregnancies, sexually transmitted infections, or sexual risk behaviors. Our educators are continually trained on the most up-to-date information on trauma, sexual health, and high-risk behaviors. Our management team does on-site observations of our educators regularly to ensure fidelity is being followed. We also administer pre- and post-surveys, receive teacher feedback, hold teen focus groups, and site satisfaction surveys. Oh, sorry about the, uh, the font <laughs> there. Uh, but we know it takes a whole community to help teens envision and create positive futures. This is why we also provide resources and training to equip parents, families, and the individuals who support kids as they navigate their teen years. So we do this by also offering workshops and trainings, including um, like today's webinar. Other trainings that we do um, are talking to youth about sensitive or difficult topics. We'll have a webinar for parents um, about this very thing coming up in October. Um, a hidden in plain sight presentation, trauma, sexual assault prevention and consent, teen dating violence, and we have a host of other topics and uh, that we cover for positive youth development as well as high-risk behavior prevention. Again, I apologize for the font. My computer does not want to read whatever that is, I guess. So CEUs for this webinar are offered for social work by Mission West Virginia. Our social work provider number is 490-129. There will be 1.5 contact hours available. I will put links for um, that information in the chat in just a few minutes, and then you'll also receive um, emails about it later. So attendance for the live session of this webinar will be verified through Zoom. We request all participants fill out our follow-up survey, please. And certificates uh, will be processed within three business days. If it's been over a week and you've not received your certificate, then please reach out. Um, special note, the certificates will come from a third-party site called Simple Cert. They will not come from Mission West Virginia. So please check your spam or junk folders to see if you've uh, received it, if you don't see it in a week. 
All right, let's meet Autumn. Many of you know her already. She's our rock star presenter. Um, she's the Adolescent Support Coordinator here at Mission West Virginia. She has her bachelor's and master's degrees in social work from the University of Akron and is an LICSW in West Virginia. In her position, Autumn works closely with students who identify a need for resources or community referrals. She also provides education on numerous topics and acts as a bridge of support for students needing a trusted adult to speak with and help them work through any difficult situations they may be experiencing. So thank you all again for joining us. And I'm going to hand this over to Autumn. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I always love to see when people are signing on and they, you know, say who they are and where they're from. Um, I just love to see there's just so many different people. Um, you know, we have, I've noticed we've had foster parents. We have lots of different professionals. I'm sure lots of you are parents. I've even noticed a couple of people that are out of state, which is really exciting. Um, so if you have never met me before, um, I'm Autumn Wagner, and um, I'm the Adolescent Support Coordinator at Mission West Virginia. And I also just picked up a part-time work um, at the University of Charleston, working as a sexual assault therapist through their SAVE program. Um, so I'm glad that people here um, are, are with us today to talk about bullying. I, I was reading through people's questions and, you know, and for time reasons, you know, I really, I answered the ones that I saw a lot of um, kind of the same questions that were being asked. Um, I, it was really heartbreaking doing this presentation because I just want to fix it. I want to cure, um, you know, when it comes to bullying, because, you know, it's impacted so many people. Um, it continues to impact people and it's, it's just, it's very devastating. Um, and actually my mom just sent me, um, a news article earlier this week. So I'm from Ohio and there was a 15 year old boy in Tuscarawas County um, that died by suicide. Um, and he was getting cyberbullied. And what was even more heartbreaking is so this boy has, um, he had spinal stenosis and he wasn't even on social media. He didn't have any social media, um, but kids created Snapchats with his picture and sending around false rumors about himself. Um, and it unfortunately led to him um, taking his life. And what's really unfortunate is that's just one story out of the hundreds that I have heard about. Um, you know, and if you were at my Bullying 101 presentation, I had the slide of all of those beautiful kids' pictures um, that are no longer with us because they unfortunately died by suicide um, and, you know, were uh, victims of bullying. So I know this is a very, very important topic. Um, you know, and like I said, I wish I could just find, you know, the solution for it. Um, but I really do think it takes a whole community, um, actually it takes our whole country um, really to come together and, you know, and start figuring out what we can do to combat this. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And then I'm going to be putting myself off of the camera just because when we have a lot of attendees and because it is West Virginia, um, you know, it likes to just kick you off of the Internet. So I try to take myself off of the camera to save as much bandwidth as possible. Okay. All right, so we will go ahead and we will get started. Now, the way that I did this presentation was I took a question that somebody had asked, and then that was kind of the title of that um, section, and then I have my responses to that. So one of the first things that I um, had um, gotten a lot of questions about was how we can help students understand what bullying is. You know, when we talk about bullying, some people know what bullying is, um, but then we also have, you know, especially younger kids that think everything is bullying. And we know that there is a big difference between peer conflict and bullying, but our young people don't know that. 
So really one of the best things that we can do is educate them on what bullying is, what does it look like, what are the different types of bullying, um, and really that's just a big piece of educating the youth on what bullying is versus what it is not. Um, there are different ways that we can incorporate the topic of bullying prevention um, in lessons and activities um, that we can teach about bullying. So having them do internet or library research. Um, so looking up the different types of bullying, how to prevent it and how kids should respond. Um, and at the end of my presentation, I have some websites that offer a lot of great information, tools and resources on bullying that is geared towards educators, um, adults and youth. Um, having presentations, so speeches that educate students on bullying behaviors. Um, you know, that is something that Mission West Virginia is, you know, can um, help with that. Um, but also, too, you know, if you look around online, there are some uh, motivational speakers that have experienced bullying themselves that now go around and talk about bullying to the schools. So that can always be an option. Um, you can have discussions in the classroom um, on different topics of bullying, how to report bullying, what does it look like, what should you do if you um, witness it or if you are experiencing it. And these types of discussions can happen anywhere at home, um, you know, and, and in the school too. You know, if a person is teaching science or math or English, it does not mean that you can't talk about bullying. Um, you can absolutely have some of those um, conversations and discussions. Um, and that really helps build rapport with the kids and to open up that line of communication um, that, okay, there's an adult that is interested in what bullying is and, you know, and help you to understand more about what our kids are experiencing. You can have them do some type of creative writing, whether it's writing a poem, a song, writing a story, um, anything that has to do with speaking out against bullying. I know um, in October, I think it's October, um, is the um, Bullying Prevention Month. And some schools will have different activities that the kids can participate. Um, I have seen where they've done like posters and they'll hang them up all throughout the school that talks about bullying. Um, so there are different things that can be done. Um, art projects, so making collages about respect or the effects of bullying. And then again, just having those um, intimate classroom conversations, talking about students and their peer relations and, you know, what is what they see and what they are experiencing. So I put this on this uh, because I really loved it. It really helps to balance out um, what normal peer conflict looks like versus what bullying looks like. Because again, we have some people that know if something is considered bullying, but then we have other people that think everything is bullying. Um, so when the truth is, it's just peer conflict. So with normal peer conflict, there's equal power between both um, students or, or youth, whereas bullying, we have that imbalance of power. And that imbalance can be anything such as, you know, popularity. Um, it could be about, you know, maybe they're bigger, um, you know, or they play football or, you know, there's just some type of imbalance of power between those two. Um, with peer conflict, this happens occasionally, um, whereas bullying is repeated over and over again. Um, peer conflict can be accidental. So, you know, they're just two people, they're just not getting along and it's nothing intentional to, you know, hurt someone's feelings. Whereas bullying is done on purpose. It is purposely done to impact that other person in a negative way. Uh, peer conflict may not necessarily be that serious, whereas bullying um, poses a serious um, threat of physical or emotional harm. Um, peer conflict has that equal emotional reaction, uh, whereas in bullying, you're going to have more of a, a stronger emotional reaction from the victim and little or no emotional reaction from the bully. Uh, peer conflict is not seeking power or attention, um, whereas bullying, they are, it's about power and control, um, whether it's over that person's being or over their material things, or just trying to take power and control over someone's emotions. Peer conflict is not trying to get anything or trying to get something out of it. Bullying, it's um, trying to gain material things or power. 
Uh, with peer conflict, there's usually remorse. Some students may take responsibility for that or they are able to work it out, talk it through, apologize and move on. Whereas bullying, there's typically no remorse um, from the person that is doing the bullying. And it's very common for them to often blame the victim. Um, people who are bullying do, they, they take no responsibility for their actions. Pair conflict, um, you know, they'll have effort to try to solve that problem, whereas bullying, there's, there's no effort to make any type of resolution. Um, one thing that I put on here that's really important is that even though conflict doesn't meet that actual definition of bullying, we have to keep in mind that conflict can still hurt and be harmful to the kids that are involved. So, you know, even if it's not bullying, but if it has really hurt someone's feelings or made them upset, regardless of if it's peer conflict or bullying, we still need to provide support, um, provide support. Sorry, I can't talk today. Um, regardless of the situation that's going on. So another question that I got a lot of was how we can help youth build deeper connections with people. Um, you know, a lot of times we see them with their phone right, right in their face. Um, and, you know, and, and that's just kind of what they're used to. That's what they grew up with. And that's how they usually interact with their peers is through social media. Um, but ways that we can build those deeper connections is we need to teach them how to communicate. Communication is really, really important when it comes to any type of relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship, a friendship, um, or just a relationship with your peers um, or family. So we need to teach them how to actually have a face-to-face -face conversation where we are actively talking and actively listening rather than communicating just through social media. We also know too, when we are communicating through text or social media, things get twisted so easily. Um, somebody may you know, put something up there, it's gonna get misconstrued and then you know, they're gonna get upset and then they're gonna tell somebody else that's gonna make them upset and it just creates a lot of issues. Um, so it's important that we try to provide those clear step-by-step -step, um, instructions for active listening. So, you know, looking at their body language, making that appropriate eye contact, um, you know, nodding their head so the other person can see that they are listening. Um, having that person do reflective listening. So they kind of repeat back a little bit about what the other person said. And that way, both people know they're on the same page when it comes to whatever they're talking about. We want to try to encourage you to express their thoughts and feelings honestly with their friends. So if something is not sitting right with them or they're upset, you know, instead of turning to social media and posting, you know, um, you know, things online, it's important for them to be able to talk openly um, face to face about what they're feeling and what's going on. We also want to try to encourage um, these extracurricular activities, um, and getting them involved in shared interests and activities as well. Because if it's sports, music, art, gaming, if it encourages some type of socialization with others, that is also going to help them build those deeper connections and also help improve those communication skills. Um, it helps them to move beyond technology and social media. It kind of introduces them to a whole new world um, of real living rather than living um, behind their telephone. We should also be teaching the foundations of respect and consent. Um, this is so important to any healthy relationship. And again, it doesn't matter what type of relationship it is. Um, but, you know, you could be as basic as you want to be when it comes to respect and consent. All that matters is that you were having those conversations with them and teaching them um, the importance of having mutual respect for other people. We also want to discuss healthy boundaries. Um, that is so important to make sure that our youth are thinking about what their own boundaries are and how they can effectively communicate that to other people. Um, because if they're, you know, not communicating that, that's where people may step over that line and it's going to create issues and a lot of conflict. We want to also encourage healthy conflict resolution. Um, we're all going to have disagreements in all types of relationships, but it's how we handle them that really can make or break that situation. 
Um, you know, sometimes I've heard students where they say, you know, that they've had adults tell them, well, just hit them um, or, you know, cuss them out or do this. And, you know, really that's not going to solve anything. Um, the truth is the person that does do those things is probably going to get reprimanded and it's going to face consequences. Um, and we know that that's just not a healthy way to um, create resolutions when we have a disagreement with someone. So techniques for resolving conflict, um, making sure that they stay calm and that they are respectful when they are communicating to someone. So it's listening to the other person's perspective. I always say, you know, putting yourself in their shoes, trying to help them to understand why that other person feels the way that they do. It may be finding common ground. So they may be able to find, you know, some common way of uh, resolving the situation and then they can work towards a compromise. So they may not necessarily each get their own way or what they want, but they're agreeable to come to a compromise that is satisfying for both of them. Um, and that's just a really great way to resolve conflict. And so again, it's important to try to teach them on how to resolve conflict calmly and respectively. And for lots of people, that may mean just taking a break. Um, sometimes we have to walk away from conflict so we can cool down. But what's important, and I always encourage my youth this, is that you have to go back and, and talk about it. Because a lot of times they'll walk away and then whatever the disagreement was, they sweep it under the rug and it's like nothing ever happened. Um, but it's not going to go away. Those feelings, that conflict is still going to be there. So it's always important to make sure that they are coming back um, with that other person and having that um, communication with them. I always tell my kids, if you need to take a break, give yourself at least 24 hours, but no longer than 24 hours. Um, because that's when we typically kind of forget about things and we move on and we never even resolve any of that conflict. Um, another question that I had received was how mental health issues can lead to incidents of violence. Um, not every, every youth has mental health issues, but we do know that when a youth is experiencing bullying, especially if it's consistently, they are um, at a higher risk to develop mental health issues such as depression or anxiety, or may even have some of those suicidal thoughts. Um, but what is really important to know is that most people with mental health issues do not act out in violence. Um, and I've always been just an advocate for this because media has really, you know, put this bad stigma on mental health because when there is something really bad that happens, whether it's a school shooting or a random stabbing or, you know, something awful happens, we automatically want to know why the person did that. And they always say, well, they must have been mentally ill. And that's not the case. Um, can people with mental health be violent? Absolutely. But most of them are not. Um, you know, just like people that don't have mental health issues, they can be violent, but they may not as well. Um, but there are some signs and external factors that a youth may show that could potentially lead to violence. Um, but we also have a misconception that youth will uh, turn to violence um, to solve their problems or try to earn respect. You know, it's like their way of getting back at that other person. But in most cases, youth turn to violence. And this is a response to having that prolonged hurt, that trauma, being bullied and having that victimization. So it's really important that we are looking out for new signs and these um, significant changes in their behaviors. So there are different types of warning signs. So we have our historical or unchangeable factors. So these are um, warning signs that a youth has had these for a really long time. Um, and a lot of this is a lot of their external factors. So the way that they grew up or the things they may have experienced or witnessed. Um, so if they have a history of violent or aggressive behaviors, um, if they were really young at the first, um, a young age at their first violent incident, if they've been a victim of bullying, if they have a history of discipline problems or frequent conflicts with authority, if they've experienced childhood abuse or neglect or witnessed violence in the home, 
if their family, parent, or caregiver condones the use of violence. You know, if they grow up in that environment, they don't know any other way to work through things other than by using violence. Um, having a history of cruelty to animals, um, having a major mental health disorder, having a lack of empathy for others, and having a history of vandalism or property damage. So we see a lot of these symptoms um, in some mental health disorders for youth. Um, so we have like our oppositional defiant disorder. Um, you know, these can really show through um, with some of um, these symptoms. And, you know, again, it could lead to violence, but there's most likely it does not. Um, so these warning signs may be present over time, but they may escalate or contribute to the risk of violence given any type of certain event or activity. So if they are engaged in some serious drug or alcohol use, um, if they are in a gang or they have a strong desire to be in a gang, um, if they have access to or a fascination with weapons, um, more specifically guns, if they have trouble controlling feelings of anger, if they're withdrawing from friends, their usual activities, they're isolating themselves a lot more, if they often feel rejected or alone, or if they feel that they're constantly being disrespected. And lastly, um, with when we look at our warning signs, so there was research that indicated that newer active signs are more predictive of short-term risk um, of violence than historical factors. So a person that has more of those historical factors or those warning signs, they have a, um, a long-term risk of it turning into violence. Um, but these signs of potential violence may be new or they may be active signs. So they have this increased loss of temper um, frequent physical fighting, increased use of alcohol or drugs, um, increased risk-taking behaviors. And so these are going to be high-risk behaviors that could lead to possible consequences, um, a decline in their school performance, having an acute episode of a major mental health disorder, planning how to commit acts of violence or doing research online or on their phone, um, if they verbally make threats or they verbally, um, you know, talk about plans to hurt other people and if they obtain or they are carrying a weapon. So our next one that I got was how can we deter bullying in the classroom? Um, you know, it's it's hard. Um, I just I give educators so much prop uh, because you guys are experiencing so many things with the youth. And it seems like it's just been a lot more intense since COVID happened uh, because a lot of our youth missed out on a really long time of learning these important skills, especially social skills. Um, and so it's just created a lot of issues. So if you are an educator or you work in a classroom setting, it's important that you know who might be at risk. Um, and there are some students who might be more at risk. So if you have students that have any type of disability that identify as part of the LGBTQIA+, um, if they um, are a minority, whether it's um, race or ethnicity, if they belong to a certain religious group, or we also have those students who just don't have a connection to a peer group. Um, they kind of isolate themselves. They're kind of a loner. They don't seem to have very many friends. So one thing that you can do is open up that line of communication. Check in with the students often about daily life and their interest, because that, again, is going to help build that relationship between the two of you. And it's going to build trust. Um, you know, the, and they may consider you to be someone that they can go to if they are struggling, um, you know, and it also shows that you care, that you have interest in, in your students and what they do and how they're doing. We also want to set these ground rules. So develop these ground rules with your students. Um, it's, it's so much more empowering when you can involve the other kids to develop ground rules, um, especially when it comes to respect to one another. So whatever is being created, we all need to be on the same page that there these rules will be enforced. Um, and um, it's going to be up to the youth to be held responsible on sticking with those rules. 
try to use positive language. So um, giving suggestions on positive behaviors that students could do rather than telling them what not to do. Nobody likes to be told that they can't do something, especially if you have the finger pointed at them and you can't do this and you shouldn't be doing that. A lot of times they're like, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and do it because you told me not to, you know, so when we talk about um, things that they, they can be doing, we want to make it about positive behaviors. You know, you could be making a difference in helping a student that seems to isolate themselves. Um, you could make a big change by helping out a student that often gets bullied. So, you know, looking at those positive behaviors rather than telling them, no, don't don't bully people, don't say mean things to people, um, that can make a really big difference. And then also support those school-wide rules, um, including those in the student handbook and the code of conduct. So make sure that, you know, you're using some of these rules that are in the policies that um, go along with the school and within that student handbook. You also need to make sure you're consistently reinforcing the rules. And that is so important because if you are not consistent, then they are not gonna be consistent with their behaviors. So we wanna make sure we're trying to be a positive role model and following the rules ourselves and make sure we're demonstra demonstrating respect for our students and encouraging them to continue with their successes. We wanna set clear expectations by making requests simple, direct, and specific. And once you have these rules created, make sure you ask everybody if they understand them or if anybody has any questions. Um, even if they seem simple to you or they seem direct and specific, it may not necessarily be that way for a student. So make sure that you are asking them and making sure everybody is on the same page. If a student is bullying somebody in the class, you want to avoid doing this in public in front of all the other students, because when we are doing that, essentially it makes us look like we are bullying that student because we are calling them out in front of everybody to embarrass them. And I know sometimes we want to do that because we want them to feel what you know they may be doing to another person. But then again, we are not being that role model and we're not following the rules that we have all created. So if you see someone doing something in the classroom that they should not, then the best thing you could do is to have them stay after class and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and don't call them out in front of everybody else. Um, you want to try to help students correct their behavior by reinforcing your expectations and laying out consequences for rule violations. So an example is I know you can stop and then whatever negative action or behavior they're doing and go back to whatever positive action you've seen in them. And then you wanna remind them if they choose to continue that negative action, then this consequence will happen. Um, so again, we wanna make sure that we are reinforcing these things, but you know, we're also in there telling them like, hey, I know you can stop this and go back to something that's positive. Um, you know, because again, we don't want to beat the kid down and make them feel bad about themselves. We want to have something positive in there. So addressing the bullying behavior, we need to make sure that the student understands what the problem behavior is and that bullying is taken seriously. Um, I had talked about this in my first presentation. So sometimes when youth are bullying others, they don't necessarily realize that they're bullying, um, especially if they've grown up in an environment that that's all they know. So we want to make sure that they truly understand what the problem behavior is um, and maybe try to help them understand why they feel that this is the best way to interact with the youth. Um, so we want to use um, consequences as a teaching tool. So giving them, you know, a lunch detention, in-school suspension, expelling them, research has shown that that is not helpful in decreasing bullying um, within a school. So if we're going to provide them consequences, we want to try to do it as a good way to teach them. Um, so one thing is that they have to lead a class discussion about how to be a good friend. Or maybe we have them write a story about the effects of bullying or the benefits of teamwork or just having respect for people. 
They can role play a scenario or make a presentation about respecting others, the negative effects of gossip or spreading rumors, um, and how to cooperate. They may um, do a project about civil rights and bullying or read a book about bullying and have them write a short report. Um, there are lots of books of people that have experienced bullying or they know someone who has um, that is available, or there may be um, stories that are online as well. Um, we may also want them to make a poster for the school about cyberbullying and being smart online. So again, you know, we we look at this as like a good thing because, you know, they're educating themselves, but also we're putting awareness out to the other students when they're doing these these things. But these kids are going to be like, oh, my gosh, I got to do more work. This is not good. So they may see it as a consequence because it's something else that they have to do. But at least the, at the same time, it may be helpful in teaching them on bullying. Um, one thing that's important to remember is bullying is a behavior and it is not the youth. So it's important to respond to that problematic behavior and not look as at the child as a problem. And unfortunately, I've seen this a lot um, where they kind of, um, you know, they place this um, I can't, I can't think of the word, but they just have this thought of what the student is, you know, um, they just kind of categorize them as being a bad kid. Um, but we have to keep in mind that it's not the child. That's the problem. It's their behaviors. And, you know, with work and support, those behaviors can change. We also need to make sure we're supporting the students who have experienced bullying. So we want to listen to them and focus on them. Um, we also need to make sure that they know it's not their fault. It's very common for youth to blame themselves when they have experienced bullying, especially if the person bullying is saying, well, this is your fault because you said this and you're annoying. Um, so we want to assure them that it's not their fault. We may be able to give them advice on what to do, uh, talk about options, how they can react if they're bullied again. And I'll actually be talking more about that um, later on in my presentation. Um, but work with them to find some type of resolution to the situation and help protect that student. And providing support is going to be important. So we need to involve the input from not only the student, but the parents or caregivers and other people within the school, such as school counselors or social workers. So the next question is, how do we respond to bullying in the moment? So if we see something happening, you know, regardless of where it's at, these are some steps that you can take. So the things that we need to do first, we need to intervene immediately. Um, and it's OK for you to go and get the help of another adult to kind of assist, um, you know, in this situation, especially if there is a bunch like a big group of kids involved. But we definitely don't want to just tell ourselves, oh, I didn't see anything, so I'm not going to address it. Because when we don't address it, then we're kind of enabling the person bullying to continue with their behaviors because they're not being told that what they're saying or doing is wrong. So we want to separate all the kids involved. We first want to make sure everyone is safe. Um, and meet any immediate medical or mental health needs. So if there are any injuries involved, you know, you may need to call an ambulance. Um, or if you have a student that is having a um, very intense mental health breakdown, if they report they're having suicidal thoughts, you know, you want to go um, and address those situations. And as hard as this is, we need to try to stay calm. Um, I know it's very easy for us when we have, a, you know, especially if it's a, more than just two people involved, you know, we want to get in there and we immediately want to start yelling and shouting and, you know, when throwing out these demands and all it's going to do, it's just going to heighten everyone's senses and they're going to be more on edge. So try to stay as calm as you can and reassure the kids involved, um, including the bystanders. So again, we need to model that respectful behavior when we are intervening. Um, because if we are telling youth that bullying is not a good thing, then we need to make sure that we are doing the same thing. Because if they see us um, saying or doing something to a student that comes off as bullying, then again, we're sending them that message that that's okay. So we want to avoid these common mistakes. Again, don't ignore it. Don't think the kids are going to work it out themselves without any adult help. 
um, they may be able to work something out with each other when it's a peer conflict. Um, but when it comes to bullying, they're not going to say, oh man, I'm sorry I did that to you and shake hands and be besties. Um, it, when it comes to bullying situations, it almost always requires an intervention from an adult. Um, don't immediately try to sort out the facts because you're going to have everybody telling you what they saw, what they heard, um, you know, and so just try to get everybody calmed down, separated and get things sorted out before you start going in and gathering all the information. Um, don't force other kids to say publicly what they saw, um, especially if it is with other students, because then they may be titled as the tattletale and they may become the next person that experiences bullying. So don't force them to talk about what they saw or experienced in front of the other students. We wanna make sure that we're doing this somewhere that's quiet and confidential. Um, don't question the children involved in front of other kids, because again, you know, there's going to be um, things that may make them more upset. Um, don't talk to them together. We want to do this separately. And don't make kids involved um, apologize or patch up relations on the spot. I've seen this a couple of times where they're like, you know, especially in high school, because they'll throw out the, you know, you guys are almost adults. You're in high school now. Now shake hands and, and be friends. Um, and that's, that's just not going to work. Um, if that was the case, then we would have found our solution to bullying, but obviously that's not the case because bullying is such a big issue, um, in today's age. You want to get police help or medical attention immediately if there's a weapon involved, or if there are threats of serious physical injury. If there's threats of hate motivated violence, so any type of, um, you know, racial or homophobia comments, if there is any type of bodily harm, um, any type of sexual abuse, or if anyone is accused of any type of illegal act. So if they stole or robbed someone or extorted them for something um, or using any type of physical force to get money, property or services. So once we have done all of that, calming down, getting everybody separated and things like that, now we wanna find out what happened. So, um, you know, we, we wanna keep, again, all those kids that are involved separate. And we wanna get stories from several sources, both adults and kids, if adults happened to be there and had saw what was going on. We also wanna listen without blaming them. Um, unfortunately, I've heard this too. You know, it, they'll say, well, you know, I did hear you make this comment and that, you know, you shouldn't have said that. Um, we don't want to place blame on anybody. Don't call the act of bullying while you are trying to understand what happened. Um, because again, it may be a situation where it is pure conflict. And so if we are just, you know, we see, um, you know, two people that, you know, are getting into it for whatever reason, if we are automatically saying bullying, 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 then kids may pick up that everything is bullying. So we want to make sure that we get all of the facts first before we decide, is this peer conflict or is this a bullying situation? Um, it may be really difficult to get the whole story, especially if there are a multitude of students involved um, or if the bullying involves social bullying or cyber bullying. So just do the best that you can to collect all available information from the people involved as well as the bystanders or the witnesses. So determining if it's bullying, um, because again, you know, when we have peer conflict and we have bullying, there's going to be different consequences and, you know, there's different policies or different ways to handle um, those situations. So some questions to ask yourself is what is the history between the kids involved? Have they been, um, you know, has there been past conflict um, or bullying problems in the past between those two? Is there an imbalance of power between them? So again, remembering that power imbalance is not limited to physical strength. It can um, be, you know, it could be the way a person looks. Um, it could be about their popularity. Um, and so sometimes it's not always easy to recognize if there's a power imbalance, but if a, a youth tells you that they feel like they're being, you know, this is happening to them because, you know, they um, aren't popular or, you know, they don't play sports or whatever the case is, then there probably is an imbalance of power. 
um, has this happened before? So has the youth experienced this before? Um, maybe not necessarily from that person um, that bullied them in the moment, um, but maybe other people have done this. And we want to ask them if they're worried that it's going to happen again. We also want to ask their, ourselves if the kids have dated, um, because there's obviously there's going to be different responses um, if it is teen dating violence. So addressing the bullying, you want to follow your school's policies and procedures. Um, you yourself should keep documentation of bullying incidents and how it was addressed, um, and that should be put in some type of file. And if you feel that the school you work for fails to address the bullying situations, then you may need to contact the school district superintendent. Um, or you may need to go above that and contact the State Board of Education if you um, are needing assistance or guidance on how to address bullying that you feel is not being resolved within the school that you work for. And you can also be anonymous, too, when you're making these phone calls. So if we have a youth that is experiencing bullying, so say we are a parent or caregiver and they tell you that they are experiencing bullying, these are the steps that you would take to report bullying to a school. So the first thing is we wanna get the facts and document them. So when we are talking with the student or the child, we wanna use open-ended questions to obtain information. So if you're unfamiliar with what open-ended questions are, basically they're questions asked that are going to elicit more information rather than a yes or no response. So we wanna ask them what happened, who was all involved, when did it happen and where did it take place? If they tell you that there were some other people um, involved, you may reach out to them um, to try to get more information yourself if you have their contact information. But you would need to be careful that you're not reaching out to the person that's actually doing the bullying. Um, you can gather documents that show bullying. So saving and printing out emails or screenshots of bullying on social media or online forums, text, or even saving voicemails. Um, you wanna write down and tell the bullying story. So write down all of the details that you have gathered and what you've learned from the youth and create a timeline of what happened. Um, and you can do this with the youth as long as they feel comfortable doing so. So the last thing we want to do is, you know, because if when someone experiences bullying, it can be very traumatizing. So we most certainly don't want to re-traumatize them. Um, so as long as they're comfortable, you know, telling that story, um, then do so. So once you have your story, you may want to read back the bullying story to someone you trust. Maybe it's a friend or a family member. Um, just to make sure that you have stuck to the facts and that you were not being overly emotional and putting your emotions into that story. Um, you want to review the school's anti-bullying policy. So you will be able to find that on the school's website um, or the student's handbook um, or the school district's website for you know, their anti-bullying policy. Um, typically, these policies should give you the steps you need to take to report bullying, as well as provide you all the contact info of who you need to make that report to. Um, so if you're reporting bullying to the school, if this has happened in a specific classroom, schedule to meet with the teacher and the principal. If it is happening outside of the classroom or school, go directly to the principal. Um, maybe you may ask staff if they've witnessed the bullying and how they responded if they did. And then you want to share the um, child's bullying story and any other supporting documents, um, you know, if it's anything that's on social media or text messages or voicemails um, and ask them how they plan on addressing the, the situation and when it's going to be addressed. So um, this was a really another big question. What if the school isn't addressing the bullying? And unfortunately, I hear this more times than I wish to, where, um, you know, students or adults don't feel that school is addressing the bullying situation. Um, so keep an eye on the school's response. 
So once the bullying is reported to the school, there, the state anti-bullying laws may require a specific process of investigation and action. So it may take a little bit of time. You may not get an answer immediately the next day. You can ask the school to send you written updates on the process or to maybe call and leave you a voicemail. And you want to make sure that you're saving all of these things. Um, and again, keep an eye on what action the school is taking. If bullying continues, you want to document all the new incidents and let the school know about all the new um, bullying situations that are taking place. So if you feel the school is not addressing the bullying, then you might have to take it up the chain of command. So if bullying is still happening after two weeks of the first report, you want to contact the school district superintendent, both by phone and in writing. Um, if you contact them and there's still no changes, you want to reach out to the West Virginia Department of Education where they investigate bullying. Um, and I put their, um, this website right there, the link is right there. Um, there's a lot of different resources and all the contact people um, to um, connect with if you need to talk to someone through the State Department of Education on the bullying situation. Um, if the bullying situation you feel is serious and you feel your child is at a real risk of harm, you are allowed to contact the police and you can file a formal complaint. And actually, that can be a really good thing because you're kind of keeping a log of everything that is happening to support your case. Um, and then if you have if the student, um, you know, if they're being bullied. Um, based because of discrimination. Um, you can go to the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights and the OCR, they protect public school students from any type of discrimination, whether it's based on race, age, sex, and this includes sexual orientation and gender identity, disability, and religion. And so again, I posted the link there and we'll be sending out these, I'll send out this um, presentation to everybody that is here with us. So you will have all of this information as well as the links um, to these resources. But this link for the um, Office for Civil Rights, it tells you all about how to file a report um, if you feel somebody is being bullied um, based on discrimination. And unfortunately, if you have taken all of these steps and you feel that the situation is still not being addressed, then you may have to get legal help. You may need to contact a lawyer to obtain some type of legal advice. So this is a form that I thought was really helpful. Again, I put the, um, the link up here at pacer.org, um, but they have a, real, a lot of great handouts um, for educators, for youth and adults, but this is just a template. So, you know, when it talks about writing a letter to the school or to the superintendent, this is a template letter. Um, and so really it's gonna help you to make sure you are telling the whole story and what has been going on um, and, and how the child has been feeling. And so you can actually um, print this on their website with this link and you can kind of fill it in. Um, so this is just a really great tool to have to make sure that you are you know, putting in all the information that you know of um, and that the school, the principal and the superintendent is getting the full story as well. So we don't have any missing pieces or parts. So ways that we can support parents if their child is being bullied. Um, if you notice that a child is being bullied, it is so important that we inform the parents or caregivers. We don't wanna just assume the child is going to tell the parent. There are so many reasons why children and students do not um, tell parents or caregivers that they're experiencing bullying. Whether they are embarrassed, they feel guilty or ashamed, or maybe they feel like they're gonna get in trouble. So again, if we are seeing something, it's important that we are informing the parents and the, or the caregivers as well. Um, and truthfully, you know, if you're a parent or a caregiver, I'm sure you would want the school or someone to inform you if they noticed that your child or your children are experiencing this. Um, inform the parent or caregiver that you're doing what you can to assist their child, um, whether that's providing support to them by listening to them, following um, with the school policies and reporting the bullying to admin, 
Um, continue to follow up with those parents and caregivers with your observations. You know, when the students are in school, um, parents and caregivers don't have eyes or ears to, you know, watch their children 24 seven. So if you're in a school setting or any other type of setting, you are kind of taken over as the eyes and ears. So make sure that you are just making observations and continuing to follow up with those parents or caregivers. Um, you can provide the parent and caregivers on steps that they can take to report bullying if they feel the school is not addressing it. And then lastly, you can provide them with resources um, that may be helpful for them um, when it comes to their children being bullied. So some talking points for parents and caregivers. I got a lot of questions about this. You know, as a parent, how, you know, how can I have these conversations or talk about this um, with my children? Um, it's a hard topic and it's very sensitive and it can be very emotional as well, depending on what your child or children may have experienced. Um, but again, like I just mentioned, it's normal for them to not bring up these things, um, whether it's fear, guilt, shame, embarrassment, or fear that they will get in trouble. So you want to start talking about bullying now. It is never too late. Um, I don't care if you have a child that is in 11th grade going to be a senior. Um, it is never too late to start talking about bullying um, with our youth and really helping them to understand what bullying is and the different types of bullying um, that are there. Have thoughtful conversations um, daily and ensure that you're really listening to them by showing interest. So just like in the beginning of my presentation, we talked about those active listening skills. We need to make sure we're doing that with our kids as well. Um, and this really opens up that line of communication and it builds up that trust. So if you are showing that you care and you're showing interest, then they are going to feel more comfortable coming and talking to you if they are experiencing bullying or if they're just experiencing any other type of hardship. So again, we want to use open-ended questions so we're getting more information. Um, you may have to reword some questions because I'll tell you what, there are some kids that are really good at giving me a yes or no answer with an open and a question. <laughs> so um, sometimes we may have to elaborate or ask it in a different way, um, you know, by how was your day or what was the best or worst thing that happened to you today or what did you learn um, or what would you change about today? So again, it's just you showing that you care and having interest in what's going on with them when they are at school. Um, talk about bullying in general. So bring up bullying as if you heard it on the news or you want to learn more about it. Like I said, unfortunately, I see stories almost every single day on the news and media of someone that has experienced bullying that has resulted in something, um, you know, something bad happening, whether it's um, acting out in violence or suicide. Um, there's so many stories out there. Um, or maybe it's just something you want to learn more about. So some ways that you can ask those questions. Um, I've been hearing about cyberbullying a lot lately. Have you ever seen it? How did they handle it? Or what would you have done? Or you could just say, hey, some of my friends were talking about bullying happening at their child's school. Do you ever see any bullying happening at your school? Um, how are you dealing with it? And what did you think of that? Um, so again, so you're not just randomly bringing up bullying, you can, you know, kind of incorporate it as like, oh, I saw this on the news today and wanted to talk to you about it. Or me and my coworkers were talking about bullying and I just want to know what your thoughts are or what your experiences are. Um, if you've experienced or witnessed bullying, you know, whether it was when you were younger or even as an adult, use your experience to help talk about, um, you know, theirs. So share age appropriate stories about bullying experienced or witnessed um, and the emotions that you felt. Again, talking about those emotions is so important because we have so many young people that feel like they can't talk about emotions for so many different reasons. Um, you know, whether it's they're embarrassed or there's a stigma against it, they're afraid people make fun of them if they talk about emotions. Or unfortunately, sometimes our youth are raised in environments where they are told you don't talk about emotions or feelings. Um, so again, this is going to open up that line of communication. The child or that youth is going to feel so much more comfortable talking to you. Um, and they're going to look at you as kind of a safe person. 
um, especially if you open up about what you witnessed or experienced and the emotions that took toll on you. So if you're concerned that your child is experiencing bullying, um, you can just start the conversation in a general way, just letting them know that you're there for them. Um, and again, you may not say, hey, are you getting bullied? Um, there's a good chance that they're going to be like, uh, no, I'm not. Um, because a lot of times they may feel uncomfortable asking those questions. So you may word the questions such as, you know, I've noticed you've seemed really stressed or very anxious. Has anything happened to you recently um, that you want to talk about? Or I've noticed that you're spending more time alone or in your room or you're always on your phone. Is everything okay? Do you need to talk about anything? Um, is there something going on at school that might be upsetting you? Um, I've noticed that you don't talk about being with your friends anymore. Did you guys get into a fight or an argument? Has anything happened? Um, and then also too, if they don't want to talk to you because we can't force them to talk about things that they don't want to, just always reminding them, hey, I'm here if there's something you want to talk about. That is going to be what's most important is that they know you are there and willing to listen to them when they, in fact, do feel ready to talk. If your child has experienced bullying, you know, we want to stay calm and ask questions to hear about their experience, pro provide that support, and think of ways to prevent this from happening again. Um, it can be very hard not to let our emotions come into play when we know our child or our children are being made fun of or picked on or getting bullied. You know, we, we're we going to feel that blood pressure rise and we're going to feel that heart race, um, but we want to try to stay as calm as possible. Um, so you may ask them, you know, is there a history between the two of you? Have you guys had conflict in the past? Um, has something like this happened before or are you worried it's going to happen again? Um, what can be done that's going to make you feel safer? Uh, reminding them, hey, this isn't your fault. No one deserves to be bullied and it doesn't matter what you've said or done. Um, ask them if you can reach out to the school or teacher to talk to them about it. Um, even if they say no, you probably still want to talk to them if the, um, behave the bullying behavior continues. Um, and then maybe ask them, hey, can we come up with some things that you can do just in case if this happens again? So some other talking points, if you know, if you find out your child has been bullying someone, again, we need to try to stay calm. We need to be open um, for conversation and listening to them. And we want to ask questions. Um, when our child is the one that is bullying other people, our goal is to help them learn from that behavior and work through the reasons why they are engaging in bullying. And then also help them to find healthy ways to deal with their feelings or their emotions. Um, you should also talk with the school about the situation um, so they can work with your child to help them change their behaviors. So it's not necessarily you, you know, tattletailing on them, um, you know, or anything like that, but there are some services in the school, whether it's the counselors or social workers, um, you know, or other um, faculty that could help them to work on changing those problematic behaviors. So some things that you may ask them is what was going on for you when you did this? You know, did you have something going on, um, you know, at that moment or something that happened recently that's made you really upset and caused you to act out this way? Um, what were you thinking and feeling at the time? How do you feel about it now? How do you think the child you bullied felt? Looking back, are there other ways you could have handled this? Um, here are some other ways you could have handled it. Um, is this the first time you've done this? Um, bullying is not okay. It's important that we address this um, because, again, if we are not telling them that what they're doing is not okay, then they don't. It's just kind of a, enabling them that, okay, well, no one said that this was bad or I shouldn't be doing this. So it may encourage them to continue those behaviors. Um, if you were the one who had been bullied, what would you want to happen to make things better? Um, or I'll help you deal with this to make things right. 
Um, also to make sure you thank them for talking to you about it, because it's not an easy conversation, even if we think they may not necessarily care because they have hurt somebody else. Um, you know, it, it may bring up a lot of emotions because, you know, when they're processing why they did this and what they felt and, you know, looking at how the other person may have felt, they may start to show some empathy um, for them. And it could bring up some, you know, some really difficult emotions. So make sure you're thanking them for just being open and honest about it. Um, and then you can also say, what I've learned is that you could use some help with whatever is going on in their life and letting them know that you're going to help them to get help. So if a youth is experiencing um, verbal bullying, so I got a lot of questions because there seems to be a lot of verbal bullying and a lot of cyber bullying, um, and they wanted to know how youth can address it. So some things that they can do first is leave the situation. They can get safely away from the situation. Um, they can run, walk, whatever is easiest for them to do. Um, but they want to try to get them to leave that situation before things escalate. Um, so they had on here to imagine you are walking away from a friend. This is a way to make sure that your body language isn't showing that you are scared or that you are afraid or intimidated. Um, and honestly, leaving this situation is one of the, the safest things that um, a person can do. So if they decide that they want to respond to the bully, um, and it's important that they do this when other people are not around. Um, this will keep the bullying from feeling embarrassed and will keep everyone calm. So if they're going to respond to that bully and they do it in front of a huge group, it's going to embarrass that other person that was bullying and it may escalate that situation. Um, and so, you know, if they are going to respond, they may want to try to do this with the other person when it's just the two of them. Um, before they respond, they should take time to figure out what they want to say. And it's absolutely okay and actually very um, positive for them to think about these things before they may ever experience any type of bullying. It's good for them to have these skills and these tools, you know, kind of readily available in case they ever need it. Um, so they may want to strategize about what they want to say. Um, you know, to help them keep them from overreacting. And again, it's going to help them prepare them. Um, and it can also help to build their confidence as well. Um, so you can come up with an action plan with ideas for what to say and do. And there is actually on the PACER website um, that I had talked about that has that form. Um, I have the, the, the link in the website at the end of my presentation, and they actually have um, a bullying action plan that can be printed out and they can fill it out to kind of help them, you know, um, prepare them that, hey, if I ever experience this, this is how I can handle the situation or things that I could do or say. Um, if When they are addressing it, we want to try to help them to be assertive and confident. Um, when they're assertive and confident, it can stop that bullying from happening again. Um, you know, when people bully others, they're looking for, you know, some type of emotional response. And if we're not giving that to them, then they may feel like, okay, what I'm saying and doing isn't affecting them. And essentially it may stop. Um, and it may show the bully that they're not an easy target. Again, they want to try to stay, um, keep calm and have a steady voice, make sure they have that good eye contact, keeping their hands to their side. And really that body language is going to help them to appear confident and assertive. Um, and when they are talking and saying what they think and feel, we want them to try to do that in, um, as confidently as possible. So ways that they could respond. So there's a term called fogging. So this is really useful um, when it comes to verbal bullying. So fogging is when you use neutral or agreeing statements to respond to the bully. Um, so it allows a person to respond without escalating the situation. And then the person bullying may become bored because you're not giving into them. You're not overreacting or becoming over emotional. So fogging and neutral responses might sound like so, or maybe, possibly, who cares, or that's your opinion. Um, agreeing statements might sound like, yeah, I like this shirt. I'm sorry you don't. Or yes, you're right. I do like to wear black clothing. Or yep, you're right. I do wear glasses. 
So just having those agreeing statements, you know, it shows that the things that are being said to them isn't, um, you know, isn't impacting them the way that the person bullying thinks it is. They may use a comeback line. So a comeback line is to stump the bully and make them think twice about what they're doing. Um, this is not meant to anger the person bullying. Um, it's really just for them to be like, oh, I guess this is not affecting them. Um, but before a youth decides to use a comeback line, um, you know, there are tips on the website down here, Girls Guide um, to End Bullying, um, how to use them correctly without making that situation worse. So they may say, whatever you say, or you got nothing better to do. Um, you know, so again, the comeback lines um, can be helpful, but there are ways that they should be used so that it's not allowing that um, situation to um, get worse. But like I had mentioned before, a lot of times walking away from the situation is going to be the safest for them. So how youth can respond in the moment of bullying. So they can look at the person bullying and tell them to stop in a calm and clear voice. Um, youth can also just try to laugh it off. And this works really great if joking and humor is easy for that person. And it could definitely catch the person bullying, catch them off guard, you know, because their goal is to hurt their feelings. But if they see the other person laughing, it's going to throw them off. Um, if speaking up seems too hard or not safe, again, walk away from that situation. Don't fight back. Um, find an adult to stop the bullying on the spot. Um, you know, a lot of my uh, youth that I've worked with, a lot of times they want to fight back or the family members have told them, hey, if somebody's saying or doing this to you, you need to fight them. Um, and all that's going to do, it's going to cause more issues. Um, it's going to cause consequences for your child and it's not going to resolve the bullying. Um, so things that youth can do to stay safe in the future it's so important to them that they talk to an adult that they trust. Um, we do not want them to keep their feelings inside. Um, I always tell my youth, you know, we're like volcanoes. When we are experiencing emotional pain and we don't talk about it, we keep it inside. And it may be okay right now, but over time it's going to build up. So I say, you know, let's look at a volcano. A volcano is typically releasing pressure and steam. And so I ask them, what happens once that volcano stops re releasing that pressure or steam? And they say it explodes. And I said, exactly. That's what we can do when we are bottling up our emotions inside. So it's so important that our um, kids are able to talk about their feelings. Also, talking to someone can help them feel less alone. And adults can help um, the youth make a plan to stop the bullying as well. Um, we might want to try to encourage them to stay away from places where they know bullying happens. Um, we know that most bullying is going to happen when they're typically when there's spots um, that don't have a lot of adult supervision. Um, you know, so in, we might want to encourage the youth to stay near adults and other kids, um, you know, to try to help keep them safe. With cyberbullying, I am always and forever teaching my youth to think before they post things online. Um, we never know what someone is going to forward to another person, what could be screenshotted and sent around the school. Um, you know, being kind to others is going to help them keep, keep them safe. And we kind of go back to the phrase, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Um, we also need to make sure that they know not to share anything that's going to hurt or embarrass anyone. Our next one is keeping our passwords a secret from other kids. I have no idea what is going on, but I have so many of my youth that I work with that they share all of their passwords with like four or five of their friends um, to all their social media accounts. And I'm like, why are we doing this? Um, you know, when they say, oh, I, you know, they're my best friend. They're not going to do anything. Um, you know, I always tell them they may be your friend now. It doesn't mean that they're going to be your best friend a month from now. And if something happens and they have that password, you are putting yourself at risk for them to hack your account and post things or say and do things um, that could be very hurtful to you. Um, so we need to make sure that our youth are not giving out their passwords um, to other friends. 
Uh, we also need to make sure our youth are knowing um, and thinking about who sees what they post online. Um, again, a lot of the kids that I work with, they don't have um, privacy settings on their social media accounts. Um, so they have so many friends that they have no idea who these people are, um, you know, and so it's it, it's a never ending conversation with them. Um, so again, making sure that they know who can see their stuff, talking about those privacy settings so that it helps control who can see what and who can't. Um, youth should also know that parents and care caregivers should be in the loop when it comes to their social media. Um, that parents and caregivers should know what you're doing online and what you're saying and who you're doing it with. Um, let them follow you. Let them, you know, friend request you. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to stalk you, but they want to make sure that you are being safe when it comes to social media and online. Um, listen to what they have to say about what is and isn't okay to do, um, you know, and that's something that's so important. Um, because when we look at our youth, you know, they don't think twice about consequences um, because a part of that brain um, that helps to control our impulses or think about things before we do it is not fully formed to their 21. So they're going to be more impulsive. So it's important that we educate them on what is okay and what's not okay. Um, we want courage excuse me, encourage our youth to talk to an adult they trust about any messages they get or things they see online that may make them upset, angry, scared. Um, and if it's cyberbullying, then they can report that. And so that should be reported to the social media app that's being used. Um, and they can usually, you know, shut that stuff down. And in some instances, it may kind of step over into a legal thing where it may be reported to the police, um, depending on what the situation is and if it's not being resolved. So how youth can be um, safe ways to be a bystander if they have witnessed bullying. So talking to a parent, teacher, or another adult that they trust, um, adults need to know when these things are happening so they can help. Um, sometimes, you know, they think, oh, well, you know, these adults aren't helping me. And you ask them, well, did you say something? And they say, well, no, I didn't tell them. <laughs> so we have to remind them that even though we're an adult, we are not a mind reader. So they need to be talking to us about what's going on. Otherwise, we don't know how we can help or if we even need to. Um, try to encourage our youth to be kind to kids that are being bullied. Um, they can show them that they care by trying to include them, sitting with them at lunch or on the bus, talking to them at school, inviting them to do something, um, or just hanging out. And this helps them know that they're not alone. Um, so they don't have to be best friends forever um, with these, you know, with these kids, but just little acts of kindness go a really, really long way. Um, not saying anything could make it worse for everyone. Um, so I had said this before, if we are not addressing bullying, whether we are a, a, a youth or an adult, um, the youth that is bullying is going to think it's okay. And they're going to continue um, to treat people that way in a disrespectful manner in a bullying way. So we have to make sure that we are addressing it and that we are talking about it. So bullying resources for adults and youth. Um, Stopbullying.gov, this is the government website. They have so many great uh, resources on all different, different types of bullying for youth, adults, schools, and educators. They also offer cartoons and webisodes to educate youth on bullying. So that might be a really great way to um, incorporate that educational piece on bullying to youth. There's information on prevention and getting help, and it also provides crisis resource numbers. Um, so the website, the link that's here at the bottom, that's blue. Um, this is part of the stopbullying.gov, but this link will actually take you to all of West Virginia state laws um, that um, have to do with bullying. So it's a really great thing to take a look at and educate yourself on and understand what laws are there. And it's for all types. They have bullying and also cyberbullying as well. 
Um, and if you're curious too, if you go to, um, if you take out West Virginia and just go to the part that um, says laws, it shows you a picture of the United States and you can click on any state and look at what laws they have when it comes to bullying and cyberbullying. Um, stompoutbullying.org is another great national resource. They have lots of information, ways on changing student culture um, to reduce and prevent all different types of bullying. Um, again, they have information for both youth and adults. And they also offer a free and confidential crisis hotline. Um, and this is for ages 13 to 24 only. So when you go to their website, um, it's a chat um, that's through their website that the, they can talk to somebody if they are experiencing bullying or they need someone to talk to. And I think that's, that's really cool. Uh, Pacers National Bullying Prevention Center. Um, I, the letter that was in the presentation, as well as the action plan that I talked about is all on this website. Um, they have lots and lots of great resources, handouts, videos, information on bullying. Um, and they have different websites that are geared towards youth to help educate. So they have PacerKidsAgainstBullying.org. So this is for our younger kids, um, children and young kids. So we're looking at elementary level. And then they have PacerTeensAgainstBullying.org. So that is geared towards teens and adolescents. And again, their Pacer.org um, bullying has a bunch of information. And then the ones for kids and the ones for teens. I mean, they just, they have so much information and it's it's amazing. And then we have our crisis text line. Um, they actually have information and resources on bullying on their website as well. And they have the 24 seven free and confidential crisis text line. And this can be for anybody of any age. Um, it doesn't require you to be within a certain age um, limit to utilize the crisis text line. So anybody can use this um, at any point. So if anybody has any questions, you can email me or we can look at the chat. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will most certainly look it up for you and, um, and get back to you on that. Um, I know this was a lot of information and I know there was probably some questions that you wanted to know more information about that, I mean, all the questions I received, I probably could do this presentation, like it probably could be like a three or four hour presentation. Um, you know, you guys had a lot of great questions and, and things like that. So again, please do not hesitate to email me if you have specific questions that were not addressed. And again, if I don't know those answers, because I don't know everything, I certainly don't want to know everything. I will be more than happy to do the research and get that information to you. So thank you guys so much. Um, I appreciate you all being here. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. And just a reminder, you will get your certificates um, in, in about a week um, or sometime next week from today's presentation. Uh, for one and a half hours for um, social work. Please look, check your spam or junk mail folders um, for an email from Simple Cert. Mm -hmm. If you do not receive it after a week, um, then please shoot us an email and we'll make sure we get that out to you. Yep. And like I said, too, we will have um, my PowerPoint emailed out to all of you. So you have yes. all of that information and um, all of those links that were in there. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the love. It makes me feel so good. And if <laughs> I, I ever if I ever come across the solution and cure for bullying, I will make sure I let all of you know. And yes, then when please. I do figure that out, I'm going to sell it and I'm going to retire and I'm going to be living it up on an island. So. <laughs> We may not know it was Autumn who solved it, but there will be signs. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, Autumn. All right. Thank you. Have a good, have a good day, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.